Hey, take your copy of God's Word. We're in a, uh, a season with an emphasis on the, the biblical doctrine of faith. And I want you, we're going to launch uh, for the uh, foundational component. We're going to launch out of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, it's going to be on the screen, and we're going to uh, actually read it together. We're going to do that. Uh, if you watch throughout the Word of God, they oftentimes would gather, stand, and they would publicly declare. We, we used to have it in our uh, worship experiences years ago. Uh, it was called responsive readings. Anybody remember those? I'm dating myself a little bit there. Uh, but we, we had hymnals, and in the back, the preacher would read the bold. I think that's how that went, or I don't remember. Anyway, we had re- y'all remember responsive readings? Well, that's just a biblical uh, truth of being able to declare the Word of God together. So we're going to begin at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 is what we're going to read in just a moment. And uh, as you're making your way to Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verses 1 through 3, we'll, uh, we'll put it up on the screen and read it together. When we talk about faith, uh, we are talking about one of the most essential components of the Christian life that there is. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace is that which we are given that we cannot earn. Faith is that which awakens us to the need, and we've, we've discussed this before. It is a, it, it's a, it boggles our minds to understand this. Even the faith that it takes to get saved, we didn't have. It was when we yielded to the work of the Word and the Holy Spirit that He gave us the faith to believing. It, is that not a phenomenal thought? So it, not only are we saved by faith, but we're going to learn that faith is absolutely essential throughout our Christian life. And we're going to unpack that. I'm going to ask you, I know you just sat down, but just one more time ever so quickly, would you rise out of reverence for the reading of God's Word? And we're going to read um, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 together. If you're ready, say amen. amen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as you take your seat ever so quickly. Hold your place in Hebrews 11 because we're going to unpack the scriptural foundation and then we're going to go over to Genesis chapter 12 to give a scriptural illustration of this biblical truth. So why is faith um, so important in the Christian life? Well, immediately, I want uh, you, you know your pastor, you know I can't pass up this moment, uh, mostly because there's an alarm in my spirit for those that um, perhaps are not, you're either not born again, you've, you've never experienced what it is to have a living relationship with Jesus Christ, and I don't want you to mistake that. That's not synonymous, beloved, with walking down an aisle of a church, signing a card, joining a church. That's not being born again. That's not salvation. That's, that's affiliation with the faith body. But that's not what salvation is. You don't get saved because you got in the water or you're in the building. We are saved because we're in Christ Jesus. So when we talk about coming by faith... Uh, We're not even talking about stepping into the dark. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God bringing to us the illuminating light, the power in our darkness. And part of what is alarming me in these very last moments of the last days before Christ calls us home through what we believe and teach here to be the rapture of the church. Now, I know that that's not necessarily embraced everywhere. In fact, it's uh, less and less being accepted, but that doesn't mean it's not in the Bible. And part of what you're seeing right now happening in this crazy, topsy-turvy world where nothing seems to make sense anymore is because you are witnessing the groaning of creation. You are witnessing. Don't don't go to the news to find out what's going going on in the world. Go to the Bible. When you step into the Word of God, it's more relevant, and I promise you it'll be more honest than than, than the newscast. One of the questions that really stirred me up for this series, um, along with the principles that we're going to look at, was Jesus was teaching his his, um, disciples, not just the 12, but there was a pretty good gathering. And Luke chapter 17 and into Luke chapter 18, Jesus asked this question. When the Son of Man returns, 
will he find faith on the earth? Now, if you, if you go back to Luke 18 and you pick that statement up and you look in the neighborhood, what's he talking about? He's talking about the last days, the days you and I are living in. So he says, hey, guys, I want you to understand something. There's a time coming, and he draws an analogy, he, a comparison. He said, that generation which sees the budding of the fig tree. Now, the fig tree is an Old Testament emblem, a symbol, a, a sign of the nation of Israel. You may not know this, but up till 1948, the month of May 1948, Israel for over 2,000 years was a desolate land, a dead language, and a distributed people. They, they just, the Jews were all over the world. They had no homeland. They'd not come back to Israel. Israel was completely defunct. And in May of 1948, something miraculous happened. Now, I mean, that nobody's ever seen before. In fact, the prophet Isaiah said it this way. Who has seen such a thing? Has anybody ever witnessed anything like this? That a nation should be born in a day. Do you know that on May the 15th, 1948, you and I witnessed that? We are living in that very season that is so pregnant with the promise of biblical prophecy. We watched a nation that had, I mean, the, the very ovens from the Nazis had barely cooled off. And here comes this people that refuse to die. They just, because they've got this miracle relationship with God. Well, Jesus said, now, that generation that sees that, here's some things that they got to they, they gotta understand. It's going to be like it was in the days of, of Lot. And so what he does is he says, hey, there's these twin cities named Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are wicked, and they're a picture of what the world will look like when I get ready to come back and get my bride, they're going to they're gonna be full of wickedness and, and depravity and pride, and it's just going to be bad. Then he says, now, not only is it going to be like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's going to be like Noah, who I called to build a, a boat to float in rain that's never been because it had never rained. So he says, that's what it's going to be like. Now, now, you have to dig down a little bit. Got to dig down a little bit. If you, if you look at those two biblical analogies of the time we're living in, when he asked the question, now, will I find faith when I come back to get my church? When the Son of Man returns, will I find faith? Well, if, if you really listen to what he's saying, this, this is what he's drawing deep into the analogy. Only four came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we know by archaeologists uh, sound conservative biblical archaeologists that well over a million people lived in those two twin cities that were immediately destroyed. I believe that Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of the rapture because he takes out the believer before he brings the judgment. See, if you're born again, you, you don't have to worry about the judgment of God. You, if I can say it this way, you settled out of court. Can I get a witness in the house? You just said, Lord, you, you don't have to consign me to hell. You took every bad thing I've ever done, going to do, thought about doing. You put it on the rose of Sharon. You killed the only begotten sinless son of God, and I received that, what you did in him, on him. I receive it by faith, and I'm settling out of court. I'm not kept for an hour of wrath. But only four came out of that city. Now, that tells you a little bit of something. That tells you a little bit of something about, uh, about how... Um, small or weak, I, I, I'm not picking the right word, but sometimes we get in these seasons when we're going through a biblical prophetic shift and people get scared, and that's okay. It, it, listen, I understand that. I mean, we are watching the dismantling of this nation. Now, if, I, I, if you're visiting today, I, I, please hear my heart. I'm, I'm not preaching politics, but I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Do you understand what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with, with pub, pub Republicans or Democrats or partisan. It, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we've lost our minds in this nation. We are in, I am amazed that kindergarten, preschool, elementary school teachers are talking to our children about their sexuality. Do, do you understand something? If, if a preacher, let's just say me, if, and, and rightly so, if, if I talk to any of our MAs about anything so inappropriate as sexual, something sexual or something of sexual preference, 
Do, do you understand? That calls for my immediate dismissal. Do you understand that? That is out of bounds. I don't meet with ladies that are not that, that, that alone, that are not, you know, my wife's not in the room or my ministry assistant's not in the room. I just don't meet with them. It's not because I got a problem. It's because I don't want a problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's inappropriate. So if, if a grown man cannot speak to a grown woman, it's inappropriate. What in the name of sanity is a first grade teacher talking to a first grader about their sexual proclivity? What is wrong with us? Now, now move on because the guest card's being tore up. So let, let's move quickly. I, I, I'm simply saying that to say this. Jesus is trying to tell us, listen, it's going to get bad. It's going to get seven kinds of silly before I get back, will I find faith? Because even the faithful are saying, okay, God, uh, hello, somebody. Is, are, are you up there? Are you, are you going? Yes, he is up there. And I want you to understand, he that keeps Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. He's not a Disney character with a long flowing beard stooped over with dementia. He sets high, looks low. He's in control. He's God Almighty. And I'm telling you soon and very soon, this bunch of mess is about to be wiped off the face of the earth. And the king of kings is going to step out and settle the score. He said, uh, now it's going to be like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Only four came out. And really, if you think about it, if you think about it, only, only, only three made it because one of them's now the salt of the earth. <laughs> Y'all a little slow. You're a little slow. It's in the Bible. Help my preaching if you read it. Then he says, now it's also like, not, it's like uh, Noah. 120 years he, he preached and he built an illustration of uh, uh, the ark. And only eight souls, only eight, 120 years of building an illustration and preaching the word of God and only eight souls. So Jesus is saying quite literally, he's saying, listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a day when it's going to get so bad and so silly and so demonically deceptive. There's going, the church is going to have to make up a decision. They're going to have to make their decision. Are they going to rely on the building or are they going to be the body? Are they going to rely on the money or are they going to rely on the ministry? Are they going to be impressed by the facility or are they going to operate in faith? Because we're quickly coming to a place that all the dog and pony shows that we've been putting on in order to attract people and keep people has not equipped people to live in the midst of this. And Jesus said, you've got to get some faith. Now, why is faith important? Well, I'm glad you asked. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that we live by faith and not by sight. You look around, you, it's doomer and gloomer. But by faith, I'll tell you something. These are just birth pains. That's all they are. Every time it gets, it gets darker out there, I just keep looking up. Christy and I were driving in. It's some big old fluffy clouds floating in this morning early. And I told, I, listen, Christy was talking about how pretty they were and different they looked. And it just, in my spirit, I thought, you know what? The Bible says he's coming in those clouds one day. And it, this could be the day. We may not even make it back to 5 o'clock. If you get here and we're not here, well, anyway. <laughs> Brother Keith will have the certain. No, that's a lie. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We've missed you, Brother Keith. I'm sorry. Do you know what Romans 1 17 says that from faith, that the, that the just live from faith to faith? Now, I'm going I'm I'm to show you something about that in just a moment. James 1 3 says that we should expect the testing of our faith because it produces multi characteristics like per, uh, perseverance and maturity and things of, of, of deep faith. Romans 14 23 says, Whatsoever is not from faith is of sin. Romans 14 1 says that we are to accept those who are weak in the faith. Listen, there's some that have been believers for 40 years, but they've never been, they've never been discipled. They've never been taught the Christ life, the cross life. They've never been taught how to mine out the deep things of the Word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. They're 40 years in the faith, but they're infants because they're still weak. Yet there's some that are just five or six years old in the faith, and because somebody discipled them and, and, and got them deep in the Word of God, they are mighty oaks in the spiritual realm. Well, here's the one we want to we, we, we really focus on for just a moment. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says that without faith, it's impossible. I'm sorry, let me try a different translation. Without faith, you probably can't. No, that's not what it says. Without faith, it's highly unlikely. No. Without faith, it is impossible. It's impossible. So what, what I want to do, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Now guess what I want you to do if you're not taking notes? <laughs> to write it down. I'm going to give you two, two, two very quick 
lessons about faith so that we understand the importance, the absolute essential work that faith does in our hearts. Number one, God will never work or does not work in the absence of faith. He just doesn't do it. Now, uh, predominantly, when I use that statement, what I'm talking about is in the life of a corporate body of believers like Fairview Knox or in the life of a family or in the life of an individual, if you've come to Christ by faith, then there, there are places where you hit the wall. You just, you're not getting anything out of the worship. You're not getting anything out of the preaching. You've got anything. In fact, you're not even having a private praise and prayer time. You've moved in to rely on something else other than your intimacy with the Father. Well, why is that? Because he will not work. He will not work in the absence of faith. Now, how do you know that? Write this down for the sake of time. I'm, I'm going to give this to you. Mark chapter 6, verse 5. Uh, it, he goes into his hometown. Jesus is, is debuting his ministry. He goes into his hometown. He opens up the book of Isaiah. He preaches and says, hey, I'm the one. The, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Set the captive free. Bind up the brokenhearted. He's, he's preaching in his home church. And I want you to listen to verse 5. But the people rejected him, and he could do no mighty work there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he marveled at their unbelief. Then he went about, quite literally, in the, quite literally in the Greek, he left that region because of their unbelief and went into other villages. Listen, beloved, if I had time, I'd show you scripturally because Nazareth, the very home place of the Son of God, they... they rejected him. There was an absence of faith to receive the one they were expecting. He not only left Nazareth, but we never have another record of him ever doing anything in their midst. Why? Because in the absence of faith, God will not do a work. You, you go to some old dead, dried up, dusty, rusty church, has no power. There's no joy in the songs. There's no power on the sermon. There's no fellowship. I'm going to tell you something. Somewhere along the line, they corporately, they grieved the Holy Ghost and God showed up one day and he said, listen, I want to do something. I, I want to do something deep and wide and, and intimate in your life. And the church said, wait a minute, it won't fit in the bulletin. It's not in the bylaws. We're going to vote on it at a business meeting. And they grieve the Spirit of God and Jesus departs and he will not stay where there's not faith to believe that he can do it. So, so here's number one. God, God will not work in the absence of faith. Number two, God will not work in the presence of doubt. Mark chapter 5, you're very familiar with it. There's a man by the name of Jairus. He's a powerful man. He's a man of position and prosperity. He's a man of great authority, both in the, uh, in the uh, economic community and in the religious community. He is on his way. You remember, they get interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood. There's a, an, a, a miraculous healing as she reaches up and grabs a hold of the talit, the prayer saw of Jesus. They're on their way to Jairus' house where his 12-year-old daughter is, is, is unbeknownst to Jairus, or at least by the word of the servant, she's dead. Now, I, I need you to get in the text. Don't just read the words, you know, theologically, devotionally. Let that thing incarnationally pop up off the page. And I need some men to help me out a little bit here. I need some men to help me out. Jairus has left a few hours before. Now, his baby girl, 12 years old, she, she's, she's laying on the bed. Her, the, 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 the bed sheets are wet with sweat because she, her fever's high. Her eyes are rolled back in her head. She's convulsing. She's seizing. She's nigh unto death. Her pulse is weak. Her breath is shallow. Mama is wiping off her brow. Jairus, the husband, walks in. This is what he said. He said, listen, I got to go. I got to leave you. And I'm going to tell you what Miss Jairus said. Now, if I'm wrong, we get to heaven. You can introduce me to her. But I'm going to tell, tell you what she said or something close to it. This is what she said. Have you lost your ever-loving mind? you got to be kidding me. You mean that our only child, our 12-year-old baby girl, is about to die. She's about to step into eternity, and you're going to leave me here to watch her die by myself? And J. Ivers says, listen, baby, I've done everything I know how to do. We've gone to children's hospital. We've called every specialist. We've tried every natural, organic remedy there is. If it could be bought, I bought it. If we could seek it, I sought it. I'm telling you, there is a man. His name's Jesus, and something has happened. Blind eyes are seeing, and lame legs are leaping, and dead people are getting up, and i got to go find this man named Jesus. And honey, you're just going to have to wait a minute until I can find him. And, and Because if I can find him. Yes. Now I'm going to tell you, when he, turned off, when he turned to walk off, you better know she's thinking, sucker, when you get home, them, them locks going to be changed, big boy. How dare you leave me? Now watch this. you got to get in it. you got to get in it. We're talking about faith. 
He goes away. They're on their way back. And the text says in Mark chapter 5, in the King James, it says, and they heard a great tumult. That's an old word in the Greek. If you're taking notes, just write in the margin of your Bible, right there about tumult, if you're using the King James. It, 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 in the Greek, it means business meeting. <laughs> Brother moderator, I make a motion that she's dead. Can I get a second? She's dead. I need a WMU to, need a WMU to make the potato salad. Who's, okay, WMU's got the potato salad. I need to know we're going to get the choir special done. We're going to get the choir special done. That's good. All in favor of pronouncing her dead, say amen. Amen. Let's eat. And they start wailing, weeping, having a funeral. Now, see, we, we pass through this text like it's nothing. Listen, this is the supernatural word of God. He didn't put it in there accidentally. He didn't put it in there just so he could entertain you. There's a lesson to be learned. He will not, he will typically not do a work in the absence of faith, and he will not do a work in the presence of doubt. So here they come up the road now. You Get, 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 get in the text. Get in the text. They're coming up the road. Can you hear them? They're, they're weeping and wailing. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. Jesus kind of got this little cockeyed smile. He's just doing a stroll. He's already doing a stroll. And he's got three boys with him, you know, Peter, James, and John, and then there's dad, Jay Iris. And he's just kind of like, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying, but you know what? My father hadn't said it until he pronounces her dead. She's not dead. Now, watch what he does. As they ease up on the house, there is a commotion of mourning. They're hired funeral atten attenders to mourn the death of, of loved ones. Now, now watch this. You know that, 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 that at least Peter, I mean, at least Simon Peter said, you know, Lord, before we go in there, we might want to really get this one right. I'm just going to tell you now, I mean, if you go in there, we're going to need to know because I'm just telling you, they'll kill us. You can't just walk up in here, baby girl, and say a little something over her. She, I mean, if you don't heal her, we're in trouble. Y'all the holiest people I preach to in months. Y'all never been in that position where if God doesn't show up, you're sunk? Y'all never, 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 never been in a position where, you know what? It's not the bank. It's not the credit card. It's not the mortgage company. It's not the new car, the old car, the new house, the old wife. Oh, God, give me a new one. It isn't any of that. You know what? If God doesn't show up, I'm sunk. That's where they're at. That's where they're at. Let me show you what Jesus does before he does anything. Let me show you what he does. He says, the Bible's very clear. It says, and when he had dismissed, when he had put them out. Now I'm going to say something that's highly, uncon highly uncharacteristic of me because I am, in case you don't know, the Joel Osteen of East Tennessee. <laughs> I just don't have his hair. This is highly outside of my normal approach. Do you know a church can have blessed additions? The, the, I mean, we, man, praise the Lord. 15 consecutive weeks we've had people walking out, getting saved and or joining this church. 15 consecutive weeks. Do you realize since the first of the year, we've had over 120 people walk that aisle and say, this is our church home. Can you uh, it, That's amazing. That's unbelievable. Now, if you're thinking about joining, we only got three seats left, so you better get it done today. <laughs> but do you know there's not only blessed additions I'm going to say something to you. There are some blessed subtractions. How y'all doing up there? I'm just talking to these sinners down here. Don't you worry about up there. Let me, let me explain something to you. It just takes one or two naysaying, moss-backed, bylaw-toting, stiff-necked, bucket-headed Baptists that wouldn't know God in a broom closet to tell you that God can't turn this city upside down. I got news for you. There's times when God will step in and say, you know what? We're going to have to dismiss this from your life. You're holding on to it, but the problem is what you're holding on to is never going to get you what you want. And until you let go of what you think you got, you're never going to get what I've got for you. And what I've got for you is better than you could ever imagine. And I'm going to have to dismiss some things. See, see, I know, I know, I know that you're 15 and you're afraid if you break up with him, you're going to be an old maid by the time you're 18. I know. I know you cried over your Captain Crunch because he doesn't love you and he wants his clothes back. I say give them back. Don't give them back. Burn them. Just give them away. No, don't burn them. I'm lying. Sometimes God just wants to take some things out of your life because until he can dismiss the doubt in your life, he can't bring faith to your life. 
So he's not going to do what he's got to do in order to raise this girl until, there, until there's a dismissal. And I'm telling you, we're the world's worst about holding on to stuff. And, and right in front of us, there's a city that needs to be resurrected. There's a neighbor that needs to know Jesus. But because we won't let God dismiss some stuff, he can't come in and do what he wants to do because we've bought into the lie that God can't do it anymore. Faith operates in the supernatural so that when there is the absence of faith, I, I can't receive the word. When there's the presence of doubt, I can't perceive the work. One keeps me from the intimacy of the scripture which guides me and one keeps me from the power of the Holy Spirit which, which, which equips me. Absence of faith, presence of doubt. Now let's illustrate this. Very quickly, I want you to go over um, to um, Genesis chapter 12. I want you to go over to Genesis chapter 12, and I want to show you why we're talking about what faith will do. You know what? I, don't, I want you to go. I'm going to go back. You go, you go to Genesis. We're going back to uh, Hebrews because I'm going to show you something before we get any further. I, I want you to read this with me. We're going to read the first three words. First three words. We're going to do it together. Y'all ready? All right, watch this. Now, faith is. Okay. That word is, in, in its original language, is, is active, present, indicative. It means right now. So watch this. This is how, we, this is how we're raised in religion in America. We, instead of operating in it, now faith is currently, actively doing something in me. Now stay with me. Don't lose this. I'm telling you, this is going to bless you. Because I got this in my private praise and prayer time this week. And it blessed me. Here's what we do. We, we get saved back here. And by faith, we believe at the cross, he paid it all. And at the empty tomb, he empowered. He, he came up with all power and authority. So back here, back, back here, back here, I was saved. And then now, now up there, because it's appointed unto man wants to die up there. I was saved back here. Now up there, I will be. I will be someday. I will be delivered. And I'm going to a city I've never seen whose builder and maker is God. So back here, I was saved. Up there, I will be. Now between the was and the will be. Well, it should be is. But sadly, it ain't. We, we was saved. And we will be delivered, but the problem is the was and the will be is not being manifested in the is. So where's the faith? Well, help me out. Romans 10, Romans 10 says faith comes by and hearing by. Oh, now watch this, watch this. This is something the Lord taught me this week. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it, faith is. That means this. If I do not actively stay in the word under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, my was and my will be will not be is. I'm going to bless myself. My was and my will be will not be is because, see, faith doesn't operate on what was and it doesn't operate on what will be. It operates on what is so that at any moment that I'm facing something, listen to what David said to that giant. He didn't say because I was saved and I will be delivered. He said, you come to me in, in, with shield and spear. I come to you in, in the name of the Lord. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. See, when, when, when Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit, it's a picture of what's happening inside of us in our private praise and prayer time. Some of y'all looking at me like I got four heads. When you're in your private praise and prayer time, the same way the Holy Spirit hovered over and conceived in the womb of Mary, that, listen, that is what happens when we take the word of God that's a seed and because the Logos, the Logos word of God, there's 30 no, wait a minute. There's 66 books in the Bible, 31,700 and some odd verses. That's the Logos Word of God. But when I, when I get in the Word and the Spirit opens the Word up to me, now I've got a rhema word, meaning this. My, I, I have two of the prettiest granddaughters you have ever seen. One is called Bright Eyes. That's Savannah Lee. And the other is called Smiley. And, and they're both here this morning. And Smiley was born with a smile. She just hadn't met some of y'all yet. No, that's a, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We, Lolly and I have a promise. In fact, we have multiple promises out of the, out of the Word of God. Not that, not that we hope we'll go for the girls, 
But in our private praise and prayer time as Pops and Lolly, we have searched the Word of God. And in searching the Word of God, and we prayed over because I come from generational curses. I have multiple generational curses. I'm the first believer in, in, in our family to not only go into ministry, but I, Christy and I are the first couple in my family on, on, on almost both sides, mom and dad. My parents have been married to each other uh, twice and now divorced again from each other. And, and we have, I don't have one set of grandparents, not one set on either, on either side that didn't get divorced and multiple times married. So like when Christy and I got married, we said divorce is not an option. We're not doing it. Murder's been considered twice, but divorce never. So when we go to the Word of God, we ask God, Lord, not a name it and claim it, not a, not a blab it and grab it, but I'm asking you, is there a promise that we can pray over our children's children because you said that that generation will continue on. I'm not, I am not imposing on God. I am going to the Word of God in order for him to conceive in my heart so that in that moment, in the hearing of the Word of God, this is what happens. My was back there and my will be up there becomes an is right Right now, so that faith comes by hearing. Preacher, I don't have a word from God. I'm, I'm struggling with a mountain. I'm struggling with demonic activity. I've got a stronghold, an addiction. I've got something going on that I cannot break. Listen to me. The moment you get a word, at that moment, you are putting in your hand the very sword of the word of God. And it's able to take the head off the enemy. It's able to raise the shield so that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Now, I know, I know, I know you think he has lost his mind. Nope. It's all in the book. Right. Every bit of it's in the book. He, he, one, one sick person said to Jesus, Jesus, would you? And he said, yes, I'd be glad to, according to your faith. Yeah, yeah. I, I do, I, according to your faith. Do you want a word from the word? If you get a word from the word, when you start asking, I don't have to worry about praying outside the will of God. Because if I'm in the word of God, I'll never pray outside the will of God if I'm praying the word of God. Right? Right? I don't want you to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, it's on you. Do not raise your hand. Look at your neighbor and say, don't raise your hand. How many of us in this room, when it hit 999 on the mega sign? Oh, that's a holy group over there. How many of us, on, when it hit the 999 on the mega lotto sign, said, well, I'll, you know, I don't normally. We even, listen, we even had somebody that texted, called my wife and said, listen, I need to talk to the preacher because we're thinking about playing that and, and we don't normally and we just want to know if he would let us tithe off of it. Yes. Yes. Yes, I would. Now, I'm not telling you to play it, but I'm telling you if you do and you hit it, hallelujah to the lamb. Tazwell, here we come, baby. Woo. Ha-ha. The devil's had that money long enough, bless God. Give some of it to God. Amen? I can tell all them religious folks sitting there. Blah, 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 blah. I ain't worried about you. You don't tithe anyway, so I ain't worried about you. <laughs> faith comes by and hearing by. I got a faith problem. I got something in front of me that I cannot overcome. I don't know how to love my wife as Christ loves the church. I don't know how to come overcome this addiction, uh, addiction, seduction, pervert. I don't know how to do it. Listen to me. Listen to me. He will withhold no good thing from you. But here's the deal. He doesn't just want to set you free from what's haunting you. In order for him to do it, he wants you to know him and not just his power. He's not a slot machine. He's not the lottery. See, when you get in the word and you get to know him, then you know there's nothing, nothing impossible with him. And when you know there's nothing impossible with him, you don't operate in anxiety and fear anymore. Now, let's illustrate this because we're going to the house and eat something Cheesy, all right? Now, go to, go to Genesis chapter 12. Go to Genesis chapter 12, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm down to the wire. Go to Genesis 12. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, when you get to Genesis 12, you're dealing with a guy by the name of Abram. He's a beautiful illustration of this incredible truth because it, it, faith, now faith is current, active, not just, the, not just the was that I prayed, not just the where I will be because I prayed to receive Christ. It is actively because Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says that the word of God is, is alive and active. Yeah. 
Preacher, I, I, I want to get in the Bible, but it's so boring. Oh, that's not on the Bible. Mm -mm. No goober gump. That's not on the Bible. It, it's, it, there's, it, this is the Word of God. This, this, is, this is the one who created everything around you. And if you're having trouble with it, and I understand it. I'm not making fun of you. Listen, you, I, I, if there was a learning disability, this old boy had it. And, and, and church people can be mean. And when you mispronounce stuff, I, I mean, they like put that on T-shirts, my first church. You understand what I'm saying? That, I mean, they made fun of the stuff I said. But at least they were listening to me. Right? It, it, I, I know there's some of you say, well, preacher, I, I, I'm not a good reader. Okay, well, you can get it on them little magic phones, and it'll read it to you. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I can tell I'm losing you. All right, let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. I'm going to show you a biblical illustration. I want you to write this word down, revelation. Now, now look at um, verse, back up to verse, uh, no, Back, yeah, back up to verse 31, chapter 11. I apologize for taking you all over the world. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the, uh, uh, and the son of Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abraham's wife. Yes, that's his cousin. Yeah, I'm just going to, because somebody's going to ask me, is it, did Abraham marry his cousin? Yes. They're from Mississippi. Don't worry about it. No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm going to be in Mississippi this week. Y'all may have to come get me. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Local preacher dies. And anyway, uh, from the Ur of Chaldeans, uh, Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran, and they dwelt there. Now, drop down to verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord had said to Abram. You see the past tense? Okay, so here's what's happened. Yeah, Abram is a beautiful illustration of what happens to us every day, especially to your preacher. This happens to me every day. God will step into my mess. He'll give me a word from the word. And he'll say, look, this is how we got to We got we to repent. This is, this, let, me do, let, me, let me give it the way that I get done. Remember, admit it, repent of it, don't repeat it, and return to me. Come on, let's say that together. Admit it, repent of it, don't repeat it, and return to me. So let's say, you know, for example, I, I'm not loving Christy like Christ loved the church. And I know that out of the New Testament, the Apostle Peter said that if there's any hurt in the heart of my wife, that God won't hear my prayers. Why? Because it creates schizophrenia in the spirit. Y'all look at your neighbor and say, you cray cray. Here's what happens between a husband and a wife. Because she's a picture of the bride. If you treat your wife in a way that is not worthy and honorable to God... You are treating half of you in a way that is not honorable. And you cannot operate in spiritual sanity if you are divided because the two of you became one. So I'll go to my study after, after Christy and I have a moment of intense fellowship. And I'll say something like this. God, I'm going to tell you what that woman you gave me right there, I'm just going to tell you right now, she dropped me out of my ever-loving mind. I'll just come down here and spend some time with you. I'm going to write a great sermon, and I'm going to bless the people of Fairview Knox because I am your man, and she's wrong. And I wish you'd do something with her while I'm down here talking to you about writing this great sermon. And the Holy Ghost will say, oh, hey, big boy, I ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> Till you haul yourself right back up them steps, and you go to the other half of you because the other half of you, until it's right with the rest of you, it's not right with me. So I admit it, I quit it, repent of it, and I return to him. The text says in verse 1, and the Lord had said to Abram. This means he had prior revelation. God had spoken to him and said in the midst of paganism, come on out, I'm going to do something supernatural. Now if you back up and you, you read those other verses at the end of chapter 11, he, he's told explicitly to leave his father, his country, his friends, and to go with God. That's what he's told. But then we find out that instead of obeying fully, now, now listen, anything less than immediate obedience is disobedience. Amen. Preacher, God's not saying anything to me lately. I'm, I'm not getting a word. I, I, I feel cold and, and I, my, my, my worship has grown weary and the word is, is not, it's not doing what I, okay, did you obey the last word you got? 
Because if you didn't obey the last word you got, he's not going to give you a new word till you obey what you got. Why is that? Not because he's mad at you, but because he loves you too much to let you go off in rebellion. Because if you won't obey the light you got, why would he let you get more light to not obey? So now you're heaping judgment upon judgment. It's not that he doesn't love you. It's that you've stopped listening to him. And rather than, rather than you doing what you're supposed to do and going where you're supposed to go, you stop somewhere back there. Now you're saying to God, God, you're not speaking. He said, I've already said all I'm going to say. And until you obey what I've said, I have nothing else to say. So see, your worship isn't gone because, because there's no power on the choir. It's, you're not getting anything out of the sermon necessarily because of Jeff. I mean, that can be true. But it can be that you didn't obey what you heard two or three weeks ago. And until you obey what you did hear, you're not going to hear anything else. Now, how do you know this? I'm going to illustrate this and we're almost done. Watch this. This is, this is his journey. He, he's living down here in the Ur of Chaldeans. It's a wicked, wicked, deeply depraved, I don't even have time to tell you. He, he strikes out and, you know, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse whatever, and, and, he, and his daddy, ha, uh, uh, Terah, which means to delay. You hanging out with anybody who's telling you to delay? You know, I w- I'm going to tell you now, you don't need to take this faith thing too far. Now, listen, I mean, it's all good on Sunday, but listen to me. You don't have to love Jesus on Monday. You're going to heaven. Why you want to live in hell Monday through Saturday? So this is what he does. He obeys just enough that he, he gets right here, and he's got the whole family with him, Lot and Daddy Tara and all of them, the whole gang. They, the, all, them, all, all the Beverly Hillbillies have made it to Heron. They're all up here. Do you know what Haran means? A desolate, dry, barren place. He's hanging out in Haran wondering, where's the power of God? Man, I heard God down here and I took off. Now, I don't understand. If I had time to tell you, show you, when they got to Haran, we find out his daddy who told him to delay. You can hear him. Now, listen, son, you don't take this stuff too serious. Now, I know God's calling you to ministry, but, but son, you can throw a hundred and one mile mile per hour fastball come on we're talking about the the big leagues we're talking about dad's retirement (laughs) you get to heron and you're more you're more concerned about travel ball i'm sorry let's keep going it's gonna linger in a dry desolate place with somebody that's speaking into your life that says delay look you've gone far enough from where you were but you don't have to go too far The Bible says God took Terah. His dad died here. Sometimes in order for God to cultivate our faith, some things got to die. And it, it may not be, the, I'm not saying God's got to kill somebody in your life. I'm saying sometimes God, you, you got to put some things on the altar that are in your life. You, you got to get over it. You, you got to forget it. You got, you got to forgive you, 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 you can't just keep hating. You can't keep looking around this room thinking, I wonder where they went and why they left and why they said what. Hey, listen, that's not our business. That's the Father's business. And by the way, for, you know, a lot of times for every three that God moves out of your life, seven show up that know how to operate in faith. So he, he gets to Haran and some things have to die before he can come into the fullness of what God's got for him. When there's a word of revelation, there has to be a process where there's a transformation in your life where some things that that you've been holding on to have got to die in order for God to take you to the place he's ultimately got for you because here's here's the manifestation of what God has for you. And and, and we're done right here because I'm out of time. Reach in the back of of the pew. Can I, if you've got one, and I, uh, if you're a, a faithful attender or covenant member, I want you to pull this card out right here. It's called Renew 22, Renew 22. I want you to wave it at me. I want you to wave it at me if you ha- do you have them. All right, this is an emphasis that we are, that you, I'm not going to walk you back through it because you've already heard about it. It's part of the vision God gave us for 22, 2022. There's about five projects. I'm not going to go through them all, but for example, the largest one's the parking lot. Um, we, we've got to resurface the parking lot. That's a hundred and fifty plus thousand dollar endeavor alone. So when we started looking at it, the Holy Spirit spoke very specifically to me and said, "Listen, I need you to faith this. Yeah. I don't want you to finance it. I want you to faith it, but not for the money. We're not talking about the money. And let me explain to you what I'm talking about. 
we, we, we've, we've got the parking lot to do. Uh, God's put it on, on deeply on my heart and, and those around me to build a prayer center because this, he said, my house will be known as a house of you're not, you're not going to do anything apart from prayer because prayer keeps you intimate with him. We've already identified the place to build the prayer center and, 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 and we're moving forward with that. Preschool and children's area, they are multiplying like rabbits down there. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we've got to do some things. Pastor David's here. Uh, they'll be here tonight. I want you to come. And after, the, after 5 o'clock, they've got a great little snack meal prepared. And you're going to get to meet them and, and hear what God's doing. But there's some things we need downstairs. If a parent brings a child, and there's two things that are absent, which we're doing okay with right now. And when I say that, I don't want you to think we don't have them, but we're trying to do better than we've ever done. If you don't have cleanliness, then no child, they're not going to leave a kid here. Now, we have one of the cleanest buildings in the world because we got one of the greatest housekeeping crews in the country in this church. But to make their life easier, we need to do some upgrades. But secondly, there's some security things. We just live in a world today where you can't play with this stuff. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. Pastor David needs to, to uh, appropriate some new spaces because of the growth and be able to do it in a way that it's secure. Well, we're believing God for that. So stay with me. Y'all get real quiet when we start talking about money. Y'all notice that? Because <laughs> this is what we hear. This is what we hear. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Um. Christy and I had a man in our life back in West Tennessee, what we, what we call home. His name was Howard Sutton. Howard Sutton was one of the kindest, most gentle, gracious men I ever met. There was nothing that Howard couldn't fix. There was nothing Howard wouldn't do for you. He would come by the church every day. Just, he'd just come by the office every day and say, Preacher, what can I fix today? I will, I, one day, we, we, we had gone from five acres and God had blessed the church in such a way we had bought over 50 acres and we had a septic system because we were in the middle of nowhere, West Tennessee. And there was a little red light on the septic system that if it backed up, the red light went on. <laughs> well, I'd prayed about it and I didn't feel led of God to go out there and take the top. <laughs> and I tried to get the music guy and he, he's worthless. Brother Howard came by and he said, Preachers, anything I can do for you this morning? I said, Brother Howard, you know that, that septic system out there. I think one of the kids yesterday morning during children's church threw a G.I. Joe down the toilet and it hung up out there somewhere and we're backed up for about three miles. That red light was blinking. I said, we got to pull the top off. And, and I'll just be honest, I've looked in there once and it's, it's bad. <laughs> this dude's 70-something years old. He said, I got it. He went right after her, ripped the top off that thing, waded right down in there, pulled a Barbie doll. It wasn't a G.I. Joe. It was a Barbie doll. <laughs> well, God gave us a word. We were expanding. We were growing. And I had been taught by Bill Stafford and some others this principle that I'm teaching this morning is called faith promise. Now, stay close. Faith promise is, is when you go to the word to get a word and ask God what, you want, what he wants you to do for a very special endeavor. Now, here's how we like to do it. When we have an endeavor like Renew 22 and we got to raise, you know, north of $250,000, we like to do it this way. Look, preacher, I'm going to sign this card and I'm going to budget. Now, I'm going to give $10 above my tithe every month because that's a coke hole and a pack of nabs, and I'm, that's what we're going to do. Well, that's fine, and I'm not making light of, you know, $10. That's a lot of money in this economy. But that's not what I'm talking to you about. Well, I had preached that principle. Brother Howard, a very kind, gentle, accommodating man, after I preached what I preached to you this morning along those lines, he'd come into my office that next Monday morning. He wasn't talking about nothing that he wanted to do for me. He was mad. His head was red. His face was red. He said, hey, preacher, I'm going to tell you something. I don't like this faith promise stuff. He said, I'm just going to tell you right now. I don't even understand what you're trying to tell me. How am I supposed to believe God for what I don't have? Why can't we just budget an extra $20 above the tithe and just put it in the faith promise because we were trying to move into missions. I'd had a deep burden. We were doing about $10,000 a year for missions. 
with a mul- with an over million dollar budget. We were doing ten thousand dollars, and we just and, and somebody said to me, "You got a faith promise missions, Jeff. You can't just budget it." So I preached it, and I said, "We're gonna believe God for missions. We're gonna believe God for missions. I don't want you to budget it. I want you to pray and ask God. God, what do you want us to do? Do y'all remember the story I told you about the puppies? I bought Bradley Thomas those two stupid dogs." that were ADHD, hyperactive, should have been shot seven times, you know, and turns out they were real expensive and they were popping pup, puppies like rabbits and come to find out those, those silly puppies were worth about six or $700 a piece. Well, that's how we funded missions at the Laborde House. <laughs> Howard said, I am not filling out this faith promise and bringing it down next week. He said, I'm going to put what I, can, I think we can do, and that's it. And I said, Howard, that's not what God said. He said, preacher, I got a, I got a figure on my heart, but I'm going to tell you something. It's ridiculous. He said it'll absolutely bankrupt us. We can't do it. He was a plumber, owned his own business. Well, Sunday rolls around. Now, I'm not going to lie. My heart's heavy because I didn't want hire to be mad at me. But I had to obey God. I stood up and held that card up, and I said, listen, if, if you believe God, if God spoke to you this week, see, the, the, the keys you not, it's not you putting money on here. It's you getting with God. If you get with him, this is, this is secondary. I, I mean, I ain't got it out of my mouth, and the music man hadn't hit the first key on, and Howard Sutton jumped up from the back of that big old brand-new building, and I mean, that 70-something-year-old man like to broke his hip running. I thought, holy hallelujah, he's still mad. <laughs> Had that card holding it up. He said, preacher, you're not going to believe what happened. He said, I was so mad at you when I left. He said, I went home, and I told, I told the Lord on you. When I got through telling the Lord on you, I went into my office to ask if I had any messages. And he said, I want you to know something. He said, 18 years ago, my business was at a peak, and I went in on a multi-million dollar development. I did all of the plumbing and the electrical, and the general contractor for that multi-million dollar development beat me out of every dime. We plumbed and, 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 and wired every house in that subdivision, and I never got a dime. That's 18 years ago. It almost put us under. He said, do you know who called me? Do you know who called me this week? I picked the phone up, and he, that man said, Howard, I don't know if you remember me. He said, remember you? Dude, I, if I could find you, I'd whip you. You almost bankrupt my family. He, and the man started crying. He said, Howard, I can't explain this to you, but I got saved just a little while ago, back a few weeks ago. And when I got saved, he said, the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me all these people I cheated. He said, I, you're the first one on the list. And he said, I cheated you 18 years ago out of tens of thousands of dollars. And I'm not only going to pay you what I owed you, I'm putting interest on it. And I want you to know on that card to the dime was what the Holy Ghost had told Howard to put down. Amen. Now listen to me. I'm not going to tell you we weren't tickled to get the money because right, yeah. I'd be lying. Right. We needed it. The septic tank had to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Missions had to go. But can I tell you, Howard Sutton, never, ever, never again did he walk the same. Because once he figured out it wasn't about the money on the card, it was about the Father in heaven and the one that could make provision, that the, you couldn't put a dollar amount on what happened to him. Because too many times we come out of the Ur of Chaldees and we hang out in Haran and we get comfortable. And God's got to kill some stuff in us. This is not about raising a quarter of a million dollars. This is about us in these last days trusting the Father for what only the Father can do. And if you get in his word, whether it's $10 or $10,000, I promise you when, you when he gets through with you, you won't be the same because you'll know something about him you didn't know before.